Hey there, I'm Sarah A. Christman, the author of the Tales of Chatsumoka, and today I'm going to talk to you about Victorian weddings. Now, before I get started on our main topic of Victorian weddings today, I'd like to point out that Book 8 in the Tales of Chetsumoka, which some of you have been eagerly awaiting, I think, I hope all of you have, it's out now. It's on Amazon, and this one is a romance between our science-loving timber heiress, Ethel Hauser, and the shy photographer we met as Bumps in Book 7. In this one, uh, there's a scene where they go down to Seattle, that is being rebuilt after the fire. And it's the 1890s now. This book takes place in 1891. So Chetsumoka is starting to see some, some safety bikes. It's a great story, if I do say so myself. And I hope you will get your copy, ASAP, and tell your friends about it. I really appreciate your support. These books are how I make my living. So I really appreciate it when you buy them and spread the word. Now. From romance to weddings. Without a doubt, the most famous wedding of the Victorian era was Queen Victoria's own wedding on February 10, 1840. Not only was it hugely influential on other weddings throughout the 19th century, but the wedding of Queen Victoria to Prince Albert is part of why the whole Victorian era came to be seen by later generations as a very romantic time. Queen Victoria had only been on the throne two years when she married Albert, and they were each just 20 at the time. Think about that just a moment. The royal wedding, not just of the heir apparent, but of a ruling monarch, well on her way to being ruler of the most powerful empire on earth. This was quite the occasion. The most obvious and lasting legacy of Victoria's wedding was her white wedding dress. She didn't invent the concept, but she did dramatically popularize it. For most of human history, of course, when a poor woman got married, she just wore her best dress of whatever color. But if a woman had the means to have a special gown for her marriage, before Victoria's day, the traditional wedding colors had been red and blue. Red, as the color of life, health, and vitality, had been a favorite for wedding clothes since ancient pagan times, whereas blue was the color of purity and chastity because traditionally the Virgin Mary is seen with a blue cloak. It certainly didn't hurt these colors' popularity that red and blue are both very easily obtained from natural dyes. A red dye obtained from matter has been in use since ancient Egypt, and woad, the traditional source for blue dye, grows so readily in the right conditions that in some parts of America it's considered an invasive weed, and anyone who finds it growing on their property is required by law to remove it. In contrast to both of these, the sparkling white we now associate with bridal gowns it, it used to be kind of hard to achieve. So Victoria's white wedding gown was definitely a sign of wealth and affluence. Now, why else might she have chosen white over the traditional blue or red? It's an interesting question. It's a matter of record that Victoria's wedding gown was made entirely of English materials as a way of boosting the English textile industry. This included so much lace that the making of it employed 200 traditional lace makers uh, and before this royal commission, those lace makers had been impoverished by the advent of machine-made lace, which was definitely a lot cheaper and faster to make. So these traditional handmade lace makers were really struggling. Victoria's wedding gave them a huge boost. Now, most fashion historians say that the white satin of Victoria's dress, which was also English, by the way, uh, they say that it was chosen to show off the white lace and help boost the lace makers. That's the generally accepted official reason for her white gown. Now, I don't like to be argumentative, and I won't deny that white lace on a white dress is very pretty. At the same time, though, personally, I can't help reflecting that if I was going to showcase white lace, it blends in on a white gown. So if it were me, I'd probably choose just about any color but white if my whole goal was to showcase the white lace. Now, as to why Victoria's whole gown was white, 
I have a few theories. Um, they're just theories and they're my own theories. You're welcome to accept or dismiss them as you like, but it makes for an interesting thought experiment. Let's briefly go back to the traditions of, color, of the colors red and blue for wedding gowns. Victoria's coronation robes were red. As a ruling monarch, not only would she have been well within her rights to be married in her coronation robes, but doing so would have gone right along with tradition on a number of levels. A lot of monarchs got married in their robes of state. But Victoria went on the record a number of times very clearly stating that she wanted her wedding day to be about her being a wife, not a queen. Two years into her rule, she'd already had plenty of pomp and circumstance related to being a queen. Besides, it's worth noting that she dramatically outranked her bridegroom. Victoria was very much in love with Albert, and she didn't want to begin their married life together by rubbing his nose in the fact that she was the ruling queen of one of the most powerful empires on earth, whereas he was just a minor prince of a tiny little German dookie. Any sort of red dress would have inevitably brought her coronation robes and thus her rank to mind, so red was out. Blue, the other traditional choice for wedding dresses, had its own challenges. Remember, blue is associated with the Virgin Mary. While the Virgin Mary is important to all Christians, she has special significance for Catholics. England has a history of very nasty conflicts over the issue of Protestantism versus Catholicism. And if the Protestant Queen Victoria had appeared in the Virgin Mary's own color on her wedding day, it would have opened a massive Pandora's box. So blue was out too. White as a color which was a little unusual for dresses because it was more expensive and because it gets dirty so easy, it, uh, it's short of a, it's a mark of status. Um, so white managed to convey an air of affluence without overtly referencing Victoria's royal regalia or anything potentially contentious. A white was a neutral color and as such, it was a good choice for her wedding because who wants their wedding to be contentious? <laughs> and that tradition of the white wedding dress, it really took off because textiles were becoming cheaper and more available. So even though it was still a prestigious fabric at the time that Victoria got married, the prices were coming down all the time. Descriptions and illustrations of Victoria's dazzling white wedding dress traveled far and wide throughout the English-speaking world, aided in large part from the rise of magazines and increasing distribution of newspapers in the 19th century. Soon, nearly every young bride wanted a white dress like the Queen's, and as the middle class expanded and advances in technology brought prices down under Victoria's reign, it became an increasingly obtainable dream for a bride to have a white wedding gown. Today, white is still far and away the color of choice for brides in the Western world, and we have the young Queen Victoria to thank for this enduring tradition. It's worth noting, though, that because Victoria was only 20 at the time she got married, the white wedding dress was seen as the prerogative of a young bride in the Victorian era, and when widows remarried then, it was considered more tasteful for them to wear a colored gown. Veils, an ancient Roman tradition meant to conceal the bride from evil spirits, were another prerogative of the young bride, so they weren't generally part of the ensemble when wid widows or divorcees remarried in the 19th century either. As for the bridesmaids, they sometimes dressed alike, but their gowns weren't necessarily identical to each other. The bride would request they wear a certain color or a group of colors, but beyond that they had a lot of leeway, and most bridesmaids wore a nice dress they already had, rather than making a special one for the occasion. That said, the bridesmaids were expected to communicate and talk with each other about what they were going to wear, because it would have been distracting to have some of them in ball gowns and others in walking suits. Another tradition from Victoria and Albert's wedding that had a lot of staying power throughout the 19th century, though it's perhaps less famous now, is a crown of orange blossoms for the bride. Because Victoria was playing down her role as queen on her wedding day, she chose not to wear her royal crown, but instead wore a simple wreath of orange blossoms in her hair. For women of less than queenly rank, orange blossoms, though still valuable as far as flowers went, were far more obtainable than a jeweled crown, and Victoria's example was endlessly copied. Some other flowers that were extremely popular for weddings in the Victorian era were white roses, 
Stephanotis, also known as Madagascar Jasmine, and Lily of the Valley. Fans of Book One in the Tales of Chetsumoka, First Wheel in Town, may remember Kitty's wedding bouquet of Lily of the Valley. In the Victorian language of flowers, they signify return to happiness. A lot of modern people may be surprised to hear that diamond solitaire engagement rings are actually a fairly new tradition, and not at all they weren't at all common throughout most of the Victorian era. Queen Victoria's own engagement ring featured a large emerald. Prince Albert gave her this ring, even though royal custom meant that as queen, she'd had to be the one to propose to him rather than the other way around. Her ring was in the shape of a serpent, an ancient symbol of wisdom in eternity. It had ruby eyes, and the only diamonds were relatively small accent stones. The focal point of the ring was its emerald, which was Victoria's birthstone. Engagement rings featuring the bride's birthstone were a popular choice at the time. Another very popular option, which Chetsuboka fans might remember from Addie's wedding ring in Love Will Find a Wheel, were pearls. The tradition of pearl betrothal rings goes back to ancient Rome, when pearls were associated with the moon and female power. To medieval Christians, pearls were the stone of sincerity and signified purity and innocence. Perhaps most important to a new couple, pearls have always signified promises. For most of human history, diamonds of any significant size were rare enough that they were more likely to be symbols of rank than signifiers of marriage. They wouldn't achieve their current place in the engagement ritual until after the Second World War, but the circumstances which made this possible were set in motion by initial discoveries of rich supplies of diamonds in South Africa in the 1860s. The subsequent history of diamond rushes and the diamond industry in South Africa is very complicated and very bloody. Sticking to our theme of wedding traditions, what's significant for the current discussion is that even with prices kept artificial artificially high by the syndicate controlling supply of diamonds, enough South African diamonds entered the world market that by the late 1880s, at least one book written for a middle-class audience mentioned that a diamond solitaire ring was a particularly expensive and showy option for an engagement present. Prior to that time, it wouldn't have been an option at all for the middle classes. Economists and gem experts have speculated that the huge supply of South African diamonds should have brought prices down a lot more, and if the free market had been allowed to run its course, by now diamonds by all rights should be common enough to be classified as semi-precious stones, like topaz. However, a pretty ruthless monopoly and tight control on supply did keep prices artificially high, and by the mid-20th century the diamond industry felt a need to justify those high prices by spiking demand. It wasn't until De Beers came up with their fantastically successful 1947 campaign, claiming a diamond is forever, that people started buying the idea that engagement rings simply must feature diamonds. Victorian wedding cake was very different from the white bridal cake that became de rigueur in the 20th century. Victorian wedding cake was actually a type of fruit cake, harking back to the old medieval tradition of a festal cake rich in exotic fruits and spices. The custom of a bride carrying or wearing the classic something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, and a sixpence or a penny in her shoe comes to us from the Victorians, but the funny thing is that even then its origins were obscure. The saying first shows up in the literature of the 1880s, but even then writers were candidly admitting, actually, we really have no idea where this comes from. We do know the significance of the traditional items. Something old is to show a continuity with the past, Something new is to look forward to a bright future. Something borrowed should come from a happily married older woman, and the idea is to borrow her luck for the day. Something blue is a nod to the old tradition of wearing the Virgin Mary's color for purity. And the coin in the bride's shoe is for wealth. Throwing grain at a wedding is another tradition meant to bring wealth and prosperity, and according to some, fertility as well. It started with ancient Roman wedding guests throwing wheat, sacred to Demeter of the harvest, and by the Victorian era, rice had taken wheat's place at weddings. Along with rice, Victorians also used to throw old shoes at weddings. Now, slippers, please, no boots. Whereas the rice was a symbol of good fortune for the couple, the old shoes were thrown by the bride's friends and were specifically intended as a mock attack on the bridegroom. Basically, it was a way of symbolically sending the message, Hey, you're stealing our girl! <laughs> 